If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 6. We've got a Bible there in the chair back, or you might have it on your device. Be here on the screen. If you're a guest with us today, really glad that you've chosen to spend an hour with us this morning. Trust you were able to maybe stop by the blue tent. If not, you can do that on your way out. And we have some baked goods after service as the celebration will continue after service today. But we've been going through a series called Jesus in Genesis. And I would make the case to you that the two most important books of the Bible, they're all really important. But foundationally, Genesis really foundational to understanding the whole Bible. Not many stories. There's really one story throughout Scripture. And then the second would be Matthew. Genesis and Matthew. Matthew describing the kingdom. Here we are in Genesis chapter 6. We ended last week with a phrase, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's verse 8. And we talked about grace that none of us earn it. None of us can earn grace. If we do, that wouldn't be grace, right? And there's two ways to come to know God. In modern day religion, the thought, the overwhelming popular thought is you earn God's favor. You must work for it. You stack up all your good deeds throughout your life all the things that you have done and you bring that before God and you think religion would say that based on your good works, God would accept you. But if that were true, how do you know when good is good enough? And if there's something that you can do to earn God's love, then that would tell me there'd be something that you can do to lose God's love. And that is not what Scripture teaches. So for a few moments today, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that's pretty sobering. For a day where we're celebrating, we're going to, we're going to get to celebrating. We need to come to this text with, with grief and a certain amount of sadness and sorrow. Genesis 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had been corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside out with pitch. This is how you are to make it in the length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Make a roof, roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kind, of the animals according to their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come to you to keep them alive, and to take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God had commanded him. Now, this the story in our culture has somehow made its way onto crocheted pillows. It's been painted onto nurseries and children's ministry rooms. And it, it can be, that story, if, if you were from out of this world and you showed up and you saw these images, you would think this guy just collected a bunch of exotic animals and went on a, an Arctic cruise. 
if you didn't know the story. But it's a, it's a violent story. It's a story that we should, when we read it, our hearts should break. For it begins with the broken heart of God. We see that God had regretted. And we talked about last week, God doesn't change his mind. God didn't regret in the way that you and I regret. But there was sorrow over sin. And today, is there sorrow over our sin? Are we grieved at our own sin? We don't have to go far, and I don't need to spend much time telling you how violent the world is today. The evil of mankind is, is rampant. In that day, God decided to wipe mankind off the face of the earth. And some of that was connected to sons of daughters, sons of God and daughters of men. And we come to Noah. Now, why did God choose Noah? The same reason that he chooses you. Not because you're great, not because you've done anything amazing, but because God has, because God is great, because God is gracious. And he calls Noah to do a pretty risky thing. And if you're taking notes today, one point to note is we have a big God. And so as followers of Jesus, because we have a big God, we should take big risks. I don't know when the last time was that you took a risk for Jesus. We have a big God. We take big risks. And then what do we do? We trust him with the results. When we place our faith and trust in Jesus, the results, here's the really good news. The results are not up to us. The results are not up to you. We're asked to place faith in God. Now, what is faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is hope in things that we cannot see. God approaches Noah, and I believe it was an audible voice. I believe God spoke to Noah. And maybe there were other people around who heard the, the ask. He's in a desert. He's not near a body of water. And he's asked to build an ark. An ark, as far as we know, had not existed at this point. Certainly not the ones of these dimensions. And to spend 120 years building an ark for a flood's going to come. A flood was not known to mankind at that time. So imagine the risk Noah was taking, right? Place your faith in Jesus. You're, you're asked to take some risks in your life. Noah took a big risk. For 120 years, he's a carpenter. He built an ark. Now, maybe he had his sons helping him out there. But he didn't have a lot of people. What were the people doing? Now, Noah narration of Noah shows up in eight different books of the Bible, many in the New Testament. So Noah is a historical figure. Jesus speaks of Noah. This wasn't just an account in Genesis. This is verified throughout the New Testament as well. And, and Peter talks about Noah. Jesus and Matthew talks about Noah. This is a real global flood. And Noah is asked to build, to build this ark. Very detailed. God, it's important to note, God takes the initiative here. Uh, who is Noah? Noah is the son of Lamech who descended from Adam through his son Seth. And it's important to note that Noah's name means rest. He will comfort us in our work. This is Lamech's. He will comfort us in our work, which comes from the ground the Lord has cursed. Now, Lamech is naming his son thinking that Noah somehow is going to save us from the curse, not knowing, having no idea what this will look like, and giving the earth rest. Giving the earth rest. That rest is going to come in the form of an ark. Now, God always provides a way of salvation. You see that in the Old Testament. Noah is a type of Christ. There's certain characters in Scripture that point to Jesus. They are not Jesus, just to clarify. 
Noah is not the hero of the story. Noah was corrupted and a fallen human being like the rest of the world. If you don't believe me, you can later on, you can read what happens right after the ark settles. He gets drunk. He wanted to get drunk so bad. I mean, I guess after a year on a boat with a bunch of animals, you'd need a drink, right? But the first thing he does after the boat lands is he, he wants a drink so bad, he plants a vineyard and he waits for that vineyard to grow. And then he gets drunk and he lays out naked, right? So for any of us in the room thinking Noah is this incredibly righteous, perfect man, just read a couple chapters ahead. And I'm so grateful that God does not need perfection to, to do his work. That all of us in the room, none of us are exempt from God using you for the gospel to, to go forward, using you to do a special work. And Noah, imagine the thoughts that he had. Imagine the mockery that Noah faced for 120 years. Imagine the taunts. Now, we've all been ridiculed for doing certain things. I don't know if you've been ridiculed for doing godly things, maybe. It maybe lasted for a moment. 120 years? Do you think Noah ever had some doubts through those 120 years? Having some believe it never had rained. That at, up to that point, moisture had come from the ground and there was a covering over the earth that had never rained before. So not only does he have faith that it's going to flood the earth, but rain in the desert? Really? Noah was saved by faith. The same way that you and I are saved by faith. Now, when Noah's building the ark, he's also doing something else. He's preaching. He's preaching to millions, possibly billions of people that are on the earth. That's been 1,200 years since Adam. More time takes place in Genesis 1 through Genesis 12 chapters than the rest of the Bible. So if you, if you wanted to divide the Bible in half by time, chronologically, you would divide it at Genesis 12. So this thousands of years, we're covering this. This has been, what, six weeks? But we're covering thousands of years. And Noah is preaching. What, what is he preaching? By faith. Judgment's coming. But God is patient. And God is loving. And God has provided a way for you to escape judgment. Now, I, I don't know if you remember, we went through the book of Jonah a few months ago. And I was amazed at the success rate of Jonah's sermon. With a bad heart and a bad attitude, he preaches, and the entire town of Nineveh converts. I don't know if you remember that. And I'm thinking, either this guy is the world's greatest preacher. I mean, this is like the Billy Graham of his day, right? He did it with a bad heart and a bad attitude, and God used his sermon. Trust God with the results. If you're doing something, God's called you to do something, the results are not up to you, and that's so freeing. Trust God with the results. Now we have Noah, who's preaching, for 120 years. I don't know the effectiveness of his sermons, Nobody, nobody repents. Nobody listens to him. Nobody says, you know what? What do I have to lose? I'll follow you into that boat. Mockery can be one of the greatest causes of followers of Jesus to walk away from their faith as if we're surprised that it was going to happen. Jesus says, it's going to happen. If you're following Jesus, you will be ridiculed. You will be mocked. And for 120 years, he preaches the gospel. I can't imagine the feeling of that, having no one respond. His sons, I don't know if he had grandchildren at the time. And the guy is 500 years old. You would think he would have a few little ones running around. You think of the grief that Noah experienced. He lost friends. He lost, I don't know if his parents were alive when he goes into the ark at age 500. He lives to be 950 years of old. Third oldest person that we know in scripture behind Jared 
and Methuselah, who live a little bit older. Noah experienced a few things. He saw some things. He's a man of faith. How is Noah saved? Through faith. The same way you and I are saved, through faith. Not out of his works. Noah was saved through faith. Hebrews 11, verse 7 says this, By faith Noah. So Noah makes the hall of fame of faith. The hall of fame of faith. When warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is keeping with faith, insults, mocks, taunts. Not 20 years, not for 50 years, not 100 years, for 120 years. We have a big God, so we take big risks and we trust him with the results. Now, this ark would not fit into State Farm Stadium. This ark was one and a half times the length of a football field, 1.4 million cubic feet. It's the shape, it's larger than a modern day battleship. And what's, there's a few interesting things. It talks about making sure it doesn't leak talks about putting a roof on it. I mean, you would think that'd be a no-brainer, but put a roof on it. Years ago, my wife and I were invited to go speak at a camp, speaking of camp. This was in southern Illinois. I was a youth pastor at the time. I was invited to come be a camp speaker. And we were given this little cabin. And I remember our girls were little, three girls under the age of eight. And we were placed in this little cabin, standalone cabin. And I don't know if you've ever experienced a Midwest storm, a thunderstorm with lightning. And I mean, it shook the whole cabin when the thunder rolled. As a grown man, as a father of three girls, I was scared. And the girls would crawl into bed with us. And mom and I would comfort them that it's okay. Now, why was it okay? Because we were under a roof coming out from the storm. This is what God's message was to the people of Noah. Judgment's coming. You're not going to be okay. You think you're okay right now. Judgment's coming. Come in out of the storm. I talked about Noah being a type of Christ. Romans 8, 1 says, for there is now no condemnation for those in Christ. When you come in out of the storm, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus, What's happening is you are coming into Jesus. You're coming into the cabin. And as that judgment flows, as it comes down, as the wrath comes down, you are protected. You have a covering over you. You do not experience the wrath of God. And that foreshadowing of Noah points to Jesus. Jesus took, Jesus is your roof. Jesus is my roof. Jesus takes the wrath. Jesus takes the judgment for me that I deserve. Now, the question we read this story in Genesis 6, and the question from a secular mind, not understanding sin and not understanding grace, is why wouldn't God save everyone? But a more accurate question when we understand sin is why would God save anyone? Why would God save anyone? For the same evil that existed outside the ark exists in me and exists in you. It is only by grace that the eight people were saved. But everyone had an invitation. The invitation was open to anyone and everyone. And I'm sure the message spread about this guy, this carpenter building a boat for 120 years. The message is is the same message today. In Matthew, or in Luke, Jesus says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. I mentioned this is a tough passage. I wonder... When Noah is invited to go into the ark, he goes into the ark for seven days before the first drop of rain comes. I wonder how many moments of doubt that he had in those first seven days, waiting, questioning, doubting. And then the rain started to come. And I imagine the grief 
and the sorrow. This is not a happy day. Church, the same is true today. There is a day coming where judgment, well, Jesus is coming back. We look forward to that day as followers of Jesus. But I don't look forward to that day for friends and family who I know who do not know Jesus. And the same invitation is true for them today as it was for those outside the ark. Come in. And every person, regardless of what's been done in the past, regardless of choices that you have made, regrets that you have in your life, things that you have done, grace is available for everyone. In Jesus, there is now no condemnation. Jesus is our covering. Jesus is the rest. Noah, his name means rest. When you place your faith and trust in Jesus, you find rest. You can stop striving. You can stop working, wondering if you're good enough. You can stop trying to earn God's love, God's approval. For in Jesus, just as in Noah, righteousness is granted to you. The door is open. Jesus says he is the door. The door is open. The invitation is there. There's a little blank there in your notes. If you had a pen, you could draw a little stick figure of an ark. And you could draw a little stick figures of eight people on the ark. And then I would ask you, where are you? Now, it's not an ark, but another carpenter comes thousands of years later. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah that many tried to, many of the sons of men and daughters of men and sons of God tried to prevent him from coming. But Jesus comes. He's a carpenter. And he builds a tree. Every tree that's ever been created was built through Jesus. And a cross is designed and formed out of that tree. And Jesus was fulfilled his mission by going to the cross, not just willing to die, but he gave his life for you so that you and I do not need to experience the wrath of God and the judgment of God. There's a price that has to be paid for our sins. Jesus paid that price. And that, my friends, is grace. You place your faith and trust in Jesus. Now, faith you're not sure. You haven't seen it. I believe Jesus is coming back. I'm living in faith on that. I'm banking everything on it. Are you? Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus? I care for you. I love you. Eternity, and we're all eternal beings here in this room. You're a, you're a body that has a soul. You're not a soul that has a body. You're a soul that has a body. My bad, I said that wrong. Two weeks of camp, we'll do that to you. <laughs> eternity, where you decide to spend eternity is your decision. And eternity is God simply saying, I will give you the desires of your heart. It's God saying, you chose to live your entire life without giving me a thought. I am going to honor that request. I'm going to allow you to live eternity without me. That is hard. Those are hard words. It, it grieves me when I even say that, but that's the truth. It's God honoring the desires of your heart. Now, today we're celebrating. And what are we celebrating? We're celebrating individuals in the life of our church who walked into the ark who found covering in the person and the work of Jesus, who recognize that they are not good enough, but Jesus is. Jesus saves. Noah is not the hero of the story. Jesus is always the hero of the story. Jesus saves. God is in the saving business. It's what he does. And every day that Jesus tarries from coming back is another opportunity for someone to give their life to Jesus. There are individuals in the room today who came prepared to be baptized, but I just want to throw this out there. 
If you've not given your life to Jesus, if you can't say confidently today that you are under the covering of Jesus, don't leave here today without knowing for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that you have always provided a way of salvation. God, you do not force decisions. You're a caring and loving God, and you allow us to make those decisions on our own. And I pray as your Holy Spirit moves in this place, if anyone has, said, has not placed their faith and trust in you, looking for security, looking for rest, and can say confidently that they have a relationship with you, that they are under the covering, that they would do that today simply by recognizing that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. And Jesus, you are that Savior who paid the price that I could never pay. And by faith, we place our faith and trust in Jesus. We trust him and him alone for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.